with Jeffrey Hughes, founder of Alpha Insights. Jeff, welcome back. Great to be here, Mehdi, as always. So we're in the thick of earnings. There's lots going on. It feels like a little lull in the macro chatter. Well, for today at least. I know we've got some upcoming news, but uh, you know we'll take the quietness today. Futures are a little lower as we speak. We're live at 9.06-ish. Um, I had a bit of a bad hair day, so a little bit of a late start. So apologies, Jeff. But um, yeah, nothing too alarming, especially after the green shoots we had yesterday. You published your weekly piece on Sunday night. Um, uh, let's dive right in. Let's go top down. Sure. So um, the S&P about 9% off the October 13th low, uh, retracing about 38.2% of the August-October decline uh, in the S&P, about 50% in the Dow and about a third in the NASDAQ. Um, that's about what we would expect for a counter trend rally. Uh, there's room for the S&P to advance slightly higher. We put out kind of a range of 3,800 to 3,900 roughly. Um, and, you know, we think uh, it's, it's a very high probability that that range will mark the terminal point in what we believe is uh, a wave to counter trend advance at intermediate degree. Um, as you said, this is a this is a big week. About forty seven percent of the market cap of the S and P five hundred is reporting this week. Most notably, this evening we have uh, Google and Microsoft. Tomorrow we've got Meta, and Thursday we've got Apple and Amazon. Uh, collectively, those five mega cap stocks represent twenty one percent of the market cap of the S and P five hundred. So, you know what they have to say is going to be germane to the direction the market takes from here, whether this, this bear market rally, uh, you know, bounces we've expected to be, uh, continues and extends slightly higher, uh, or whether things just turn on a dime and uh, start lower, which is our, our expectation ultimately. We've been talking about a window between October 25th and November 8th. Today is October 25th. We think this would be a perfect date for the S&P 500 to top and roll over hard down into the election cycle date. Uh, we've got, again, these big earnings reports this week. We've also got third quarter GDP coming out, I believe, on Friday. You've got a Fed meeting on the 2nd of November. Uh, so this next two-week period is really going to have a lot of new information. Uh, we've also heard the Fed talking about pivots. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the street is very, very excited about a pivot. And we've got a lot of reasons why they might want to rethink that. So, Jeff, you know, um, it will tie into the whole pivot story as well. But there's been a lot of inflationist, uh, inflationists who have been uh, talking and comparing things to the 1970s situation. Yeah. You go through this in your weekly piece. Why don't you talk us through how things actually panned out in the 70s? Sure. So, you know, we, we actually stole this chart from uh, George Noble's Twitter feed. If you don't know George, he's a, you know, old school portfolio manager, worked for uh, Peter Lynch at uh, Fidelity back in the uh, 80s and 90s. And, you know, um, great guy. He runs a really interesting spaces on Twitter. Uh, it's kind of a bare echo chamber, but, you know, you do get a, a few tidbits like this every now and then, which I think are really important. He credited Piper Sandler for this chart. I think it was probably... Uh, Michael Kantrowitz, who published it. I just want to make sure everybody gets proper credit here. But, um, you know, the point is that, um, you know, the Fed did pivot in 1974, but they were late. Uh, they had been tightening aggressively. Uh, the market had already declined 25%, pretty much like we have uh, in 2022, right? Uh, the Fed uh, decided to step back uh, from uh, tightening. In other words, they halted their tightening. Uh, they didn't begin to ease necessarily, but, you know, that was considered to be the pivot, so to speak, and uh, the market continued down substantially lower. Um, so, you know, this seems to be uh, a consistent problem, and, and, and the problem that I think that uh, most people uh, have is they think it's going to be good news when the Fed pivots, but if we look at the historical record, uh, it really isn't. And, and, you know, it's my opinion at this point that we're probably in the early stages of a recession right now. And, uh, you know, if in fact the Fed does uh, step back from uh, aggressive tightening, uh, I don't think they're going to ease anytime soon. I think that the uh, consensus view is that we'll see a 75 basis point rate hike on February or on uh, 
November 2nd. And then uh, perhaps in December, we see that scaled back to a 50. And then maybe in uh, the first quarter, we start to see some 25s before the Fed thinks that they're at a level that would be consistent with neutral. Uh, they've already been targeting kind of this terminal level of 462 or so, you know, kind of in that four and a half to four and three quarters level. Uh, I've even heard some Fed officials saying 5%. Uh, but, you know, there's a big Wall Street Journal article last week. And uh, everybody's kind of excited about the fact that the Fed is going to uh, start this transition. And, and I don't think that's anything that wasn't already known. So, Jeff, this is a very interesting slide here. You, you kind of highlight uh, a market sell-off even on the back of the, the bullish news that people are trying to, to put in front of us. Exactly. To, to my earlier point, uh, you know, the, the historical record is such that this, this pivot has been a consistent problem. The Fed is usually late. The economy is usually already in recession by the time they stop tightening and pivot uh, to an easing or back away from tightening, so to speak. And if we look over the last 50 years at, uh, you know, the, the last six major recessions, we won't include the COVID crash because that was kind of a self-inflicted wound. But, you know, we can go back to 1969. Uh, you know, we saw a near 19% stock market decline. The pivot occurred in March 1970. Uh, the low occurred in June of 1970, three months later. That was the best, okay? In 73, uh, we saw a recession kick off. The market was down over 40%. They pivoted in October of 73, but the market didn't uh, bottom until September of 74 on a monthly closing basis. That was 11 months. In the 80s, there was a double dip recession in the 1980-82 uh, timeframe. Uh, the Fed pivoted in June of 81. The market didn't bottom until July of 82. That was 13 months later. Uh, during the Gulf War recession, which was you know, kind of a, a very modest stock market decline, on a monthly closing basis. Uh, the Fed pivot actually occurred in June of 89. The market bottomed October of 1990. That was 16 months later. Uh, following the dot-com uh, bubble, uh, the recession that ensued thereafter uh, was you know, basically concomitant with about a 38% decline in stocks. Uh, the Fed pivoted in December 2000. The market didn't bottom for almost two more years, 21 months, in September of 2002. And then, of course, the great financial crisis saw 50% decline in stocks. Uh, the Fed's pivot came in August of 2007, before the market topped even. And uh, the, uh, the uh, stock market didn't actually uh, find its lows until February of 2009 on a monthly closing basis. That was 18 months lower. So, you know, I think anybody who's really focused on this Fed pivot as being uh, something that's bullish really needs to review the historical record. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that will fill in the blanks for them. So it feels like we really have no escape from this, uh, this sell-off. Well, you know, the average decline in stocks was 28%, and the average pivot to bottom period was 14 months. So, you know, if we're going to call, you know, kind of the, the last 75 basis point uh, rate hike, uh, the point where the Fed pivoted, I think we can expect to see considerable downside over the next year. So why don't you, uh, you know, this week you also sprinkled in some geopolitical Chinese risk as well. So, you know, how's that tie into everything? Everybody's always asking me, what's the catalyst for decline, Jeff? You know, uh, it doesn't seem like things are that bad in the real economy at this point. And, you know, with, without even going into all of the issues with the liquidity withdrawal and monetary uh, policy tightening and the implications for that, you know, six to 12 months out, in the real economy and how stock markets tend to trade during recessions. And the fact that the Fed has told us, all but told us that they're going to take the economy into recession, that is their plan in order to, to defeat inflation. Um, I think we just step back from that and take a look at the, the headlines in the newspapers. I mean, you've got some major issues going on uh, in Europe and in Asia, specifically with China. Over the weekend, we had uh, you know the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, a Communist Party Congress, where uh, you know President Xi was now uh, has now solidified his uh, third unprecedented third term in office. So he will be the president of China for the next five years. We all know Xi is a hardliner, and he's now stacked the deck 
with hardliner loyalists behind him. And, uh, you know, to the point where they even made a, a point of escorting out uh, the former uh, president, his predecessor, who was a, a well-known reformist uh, in kind of a show of strength that, hey, you know, we are now in charge here. Xi has made it very, very clear in statements that uh, China reserves the right to use military force in order to reunify Taiwan with mainland China. And uh, the CCP is not, uh, uh, you know, they don't pull any punches. We can just look to the playbook in Hong Kong to see that there is a long history of China uh, kind of jumping the gun and, uh, you know, taking action forcefully in order to see that their um, uh, foreign policy objectives are, are achieved. I think there's a very high probability, and I'm not the only one, uh, many officials in the U.S. military have now commented publicly that there is a possibility that China will make a military move against Taiwan before year end. And, and I think that we should factor that in as one of the reasons why stocks could continue to trade substantially lower going into the next 12 months. All right, so today being a Montgomery cycle day, October the 25th, as you've been highlighting over the last several months, um, let's talk technicals. How are we looking here? Well, you know, um, like I said, you know, stocks have bounced off their lows by about 9%. Um, it doesn't look like much when you look at this chart. I mean, you know, we, we came off the lows. It was, it was an impressive bounce. Uh, you know, but thus far, I think, um, you know, it is very much a counter trend uh, price action, you know, very overlapping, uh, you know, not not impulsive in any way, shape or form at this point. And so, you know, despite uh, the fact that, you know, we've already achieved uh, a technical target of around 3,500 on the S&P, which was the uh, measured move count that we came up uh, with from the initial um classic pattern top formation of the head and shoulders of variety that we've been talking about for some time. We now want to emphasize the fact that there is an inverted cup and handle pattern that is now dominant. And what I mean by that is that um, the pattern overwhelms the previous pattern. So the prior target really should be looked at as an initial downside target. And based on the fact that we've already broken that neckline on the inverted cup and handle pattern, uh, and we've already broken the 200-week simple moving average, the 200-week exponential moving average, and the 50% retracement. Even though we're bouncing from that, we think this is counter trend and the next move to the downside could fulfill that measured move price target from this classic pattern top formation, which would take us down to about S&P 2500. We don't have any specific time frame that that is necessarily uh, going to play out. Uh, but we do think over the next, you know, um, weeks and months, we should be making a lot of progress toward that uh, target. And what about from a cycle degree Elliott wave count? Yeah. So, so you know, let me just uh, uh, clarify that cycles and Elliott wave are two separate things. But, but let me just simply say uh, that we use what's known a cycle degree uh, measure. Okay. And so uh, the last cycle de degree advance. Uh, began in March 2009 and ended, we believe, in January of 2022 this year. Uh, that was cycle wave five. And if we're only correcting cycle wave five, we think a minimum retracement would be 38.2%. We have not gotten there yet. Uh, that's about 3,200 on the S&P. Uh, but we think more likely a Fibonacci 61.8% retracement, which would bring us down to about 2,250 on the S&P 500 is probable. That also coincides with the prior uh, uh, wave four extreme uh, and also the 200 month simple moving average all coalesce around that level. And uh, that is our target on a cycle degree correction. Now we do believe that this, this correction is really part of something even bigger, uh, a super cycle degree correction, which could take the market substantially lower. So once we hit that initial target at 2250, we would expect a substantial counter trend advance off of that level, which could retrace about 50% of the entire decline. Uh, before the final wave, wave C, and, and that counter trend would be known as wave B. Uh, so wave C would then carry the market uh, significantly lower than our initial target of 2250 on the S&P, which is our, 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 our um, cycle wave A decline. So, so at the end of the day, 
we're looking for a significant decline in the S&P 500 from current levels uh, based on this analysis. And what about on an alternate short-term basis? Yeah, so looking at the short-term wave counts, there's a couple of alternates that we've been uh, discussing. Uh, the first one on the left, alternate number one, suggests that the S&P could retrace up to about 50% of the decline off the August 16th high. Uh, we're counting the entire move down from August 16 high to the October 13 low as uh, intermediate wave one of primary wave three down of cycle wave A down. Uh, that would suggest that um, you know a 50% retracement could carry us to around 3,910 on the S&P 500. And uh, that should terminate the counter trend advance. And uh, we would count that then as intermediate wave two, and that would precede intermediate wave three down, which would be uh, really the most forceful downside wave in the entire count to date off the January highs. Now, our second alternate actually suggests that, you know, we may have topped already. And, and as you know, we've been talking about these um, Count, or these um, cycle dates, Montgomery cycle turn dates. And today happens to be the October 25th major Montgomery cycle turn date. It's possible, and we're not guaranteeing this by any stretch. This is one of the, you know, part of our working hypothesis. It's possible that we are topping today uh, or have already topped at the 38.2% uh, retracement of the decline off of the September 12th high. In this particular count, we count the initial decline into the uh, September 6th low uh, area as kind of being um, intermediate wave one, and then the rally into the September 12th high as being intermediate wave two, which means that we're now counting down at minor wave degree, which is gonna be shallower. So the rally that, or I should say the decline into the um, October 13th low is now minor wave one of intermediate wave three, and that the counter trend bounce that we've seen off of that low is minor wave two of intermediate wave three, of primary wave three down. So we would be setting up for a third of a third of a third wave decline if in fact minor wave two is topping right now uh, on a Montgomery cycle turn date. One possibility. We would then suggest that the next move to the downside would be a very dramatic decline. And what could be a catalyst for that? Um, well, you know, we've got, again, a lot of important earnings reports coming out in the next three days. Again, we've got a third quarter GDP result coming out. We've got another CPI report coming out. We've got a Fed meeting, uh, uh, you know, to look forward to on uh, November 2nd. All of those big information uh, pools could influence the direction of the market. And if in fact that counts correct, we think it would be to the downside and perhaps could carry uh, prices lower into the election on November 8th, which is the next major Montgomery cycle turn date. That is one of our possible counts here. So we're kind of playing this thing uh, day by day, but we just want viewers to know that, you know, nothing is certain and time really is a lesser component of our analysis. Price action and wave count is primary to this analysis. And the count suggests that we are still early in the cycle degree um, uh, development of wave A down. Just to clarify, no matter what happens on the alternates, we either get a little bump here for a, you know, a short period, but either way, whatever happens going into November the 8th, we expect to see downside. Yeah, again, the calendar notwithstanding, we expect to see downside. We think that this is a counter trend advance that will terminate at some level between here and the 618 retracement of the decline off the uh, August 16th high, and that the next big directional move, whether it comes now and, and in this window between now and the, uh, the election or after the election, uh, will be down and will be to S&P 2250. That's our current view. Got it. How are the market internals looking? Yeah, so market internals uh, have been uh, improving, okay? We're bouncing off the lows that were in place a week, week and a half ago. Uh, we are seeing some divergences. Uh, positive divergences are consistent with the bounce that we're seeing. Uh, they don't necessarily mean that we've found, you know, a permanent uh, low. 
uh, v low, so to speak, you know, we found a low. And, and we think that was, as we pointed out, uh, probably intermediate wave one low, and probably we're seeing something in the neighborhood of a, you know, um, counter trend advance that could carry up to, uh, say, a 50% retracement of that decline. And so, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a positive momentum divergence, pos positive uh, volume divergence, uh, as we're seeing breadth uh, make new lows. And so, you know, the key that I would point out here is that our, our five week moving average of the uh, percentage of net advancing issues has turned up off a new low. That new low uh, actually marked the um, October 13th low. So, you know, usually you would see a breadth divergence. We did not see a breadth divergence. We saw a new low in breadth. However, we did see a momentum divergence using the five-week RSA oscillator as our, as our momentum gauge here. And so if we're just kind of looking at so far the October low versus the May low, there is a positive divergence. But, you know, I would point out that, you know, divergences can, can be and often are resolved. And so if, you know, the market were to turn hard down, uh, momentum would follow, and this would very likely erase this uh, divergence. So right now it's temporary until we make a new high, uh, at the very least get above the median line. And so um, that is, you know, I think more consistent with a, uh, a counter trend advance than a, you know, durable tradable low. Um, the final thing I'd point out is that, you know, volume has uh, improved. You know, the uh, up volume uh, was about 89% of total S&P volume last week. That was a big day, but you know, yesterday we had a big 400 point up day and uh, up volume was only about 53% of total volume. So, you know, it's it's kind of fleeting, you know, the five week moving average of the ratio of up down volume has recovered off of its all time record low a week ago to just 1.7 times. That's not a very strong reading. We'd wanna see a three to one or better rating uh, or, or ratio. Uh, to really feel confident that uh, we've got some durability to this advance. And, and it's just not there at this point. So again, divergences um, do signal minor trend change at the very least, but they often uh, are resolved uh, in the opposite direction. And so we would be on alert for that. And Jeff, let's have a look at investor sentiment. It looks like we have a small bounce here as well. Yeah. So, you know, um, I just point. I entitled this. Uh, you know, the the consensus is correct seventy percent of the time here, and so you know the point is we're looking at kind of a consensus. You know, crowd psychology here, right? And the crowd psychology uh, at the professional level is still underweight equity, so they're still pretty bearish. We're off the lows pretty substantially. I mean, uh, the recent lows were about twenty percent net equity exposure. Uh, this past week, uh, we got up to about 43%, so doubling that. Uh, if we look at individual investors, they've remained relatively flat. Uh, the bulls are kind of holding in around 22% or so, the bears around 56%. So there's you know, a fairly significant bull bear spread, uh, which is now around negative 33%. That is up from the lows of negative 44% in September, um, the point is, and, and, and I kind of said this before, we've been playing whack-a-mole here. Every time the market, you know, uh, rallies a little bit off of its lows, everybody gets excited. Uh, they start to get more bullish. And then all of a sudden the market turns down and makes a new low and everybody gets bearish again. Um, the other thing that I would point out is that uh, if we look back over the past 15 years, back to the great financial crisis, we can see that despite as bearish as things are uh, at the individual level and the professional level, they were much more bearish uh, at the absolute lows in 2008. So, um, you know, we think that uh, sentiment can get worse than it is now when things turn really, really bad. And volatility has been uh, a topic of conversation over the last several weeks as well. It seems like this up, you know, we were on the rise for the last few weeks for sure. Um, and they've kind of slowed down a little bit here. Well, yeah, I think we're in a consolidation, no question about it. We're above the boiling point. The boiling point in our view is anything north of 24%. That's typically coincided with a volume spike. We did see a minor volume spike. Uh, and then, you know, we've kind of been trading back and forth here. We did break below the 21 day moving average as of Friday's close, but we're back above it now. Uh, in fact, uh, yesterday, despite a 400 point rally in the Dow, 
Uh, the VIX was actually up a couple percent. And so you know, we're back above 30% on the VIX. Uh, we're above the 21 day moving average. We're above the 24% boiling point. All of this suggests that you know, uh, volatility is trending higher. And I think a breakout above this range that we've highlighted here will really propel volatility back above 40%. We haven't seen a print above 40% in almost two years. So we really haven't seen any fear in the market. And despite a 25% decline, it's been relatively orderly. And you know, despite as, as, as weak as investor sentiment is, we haven't seen a big volatility spike to suggest that there is overwhelming fear in the market. We think the next big uh, move to the upside in the VIX will follow the S&P as we see the S&P, the Dow, and the NASDAQ all break below their October 13th lows. So let's have a little look at some sectors. Um, obviously, sectors energy seems to be uh, back again. Yeah, it's the big uh, surprise last week, right? Um, you know, energy had been kind of flagging. It had been under pressure. Um, oil prices have been under pressure. Uh, you've got the Biden administration, you know, uh, uh, releasing reserves to kind of hold prices down. Uh, and you've got OPEC cutting production, trying to lift it back up. Um, they're mostly focused on uh, the Brent level where, uh, you know, the, the administration's a little more focused on light, sweet, crude, the WTI levels. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we haven't seen, um, you know, uh, elevated oil prices back above, say, 100, where they had been earlier in the year, driving energy stocks. That being said, energy stocks are breaking out again. And uh, they were the leaders last week. And, uh, you know, frankly, um, if we were going to make a bet on a sector basis, on a 12-month on a go-forward basis, energy would be our number one sector bet, and it ranks number one in our sector work and has for the better part of the year. So that hasn't changed despite the sort of uh, lull that we saw in price action over the course of the last several months. Um, I would say at this point, uh, energy should continue to lead the market going forward. Well, and looking at this next chart of, you know, big tech versus big energy, um, it's an interesting one as well when you put it out like this. Yeah, you know, what we did is we, we looked at year-to-date performance of the, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft, Google versus ExxonMobil and Chevron, which, you know, collectively, uh, you know, account for about 40% of the energy sector. So those are the biggies. And, you know, if we look at the, you know, the FAM stocks, um, those are really the biggies. All seven of these stocks are reporting this week. Uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron report Friday before the open. And so if we take a look at, you know, year-to-date performance, uh, it, it really is quite telling. You know, you've got uh, ExxonMobil leading the charge. You've got Chevron right behind it. Apple is the only FANG stock that's actually in positive territory. Uh, and, uh, you know, frankly, when we look at, you know, Microsoft and Amazon and uh, Alphabet and, and uh, 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 Meta, you know, uh, Facebook changes name to Meta, they're all do doing uh, very, very poorly relative to the market, all underperforming by a wide margin. And, you know, I think we're going to get uh, some really important information and insight about the direction of their businesses in the next three days. Um, we're not expecting to see uh, a positive uh, news flow come from these guys, especially Meta. Uh, I think things are looking pretty dire there. So how do we make some money, Jeff? What yeah. are we looking at? Normally, we put out our top five longs, top five shorts, but we just decided to kind of look at these seven stocks in detail. And, uh, you know, the one that really stood out on the long side to us is ExxonMobil. Uh, that's where I would want to place my bets at this point. Uh, the stock went out around 106 last night, uh, you know, broke out above 105 to make a new all-time record uh, weekly closing high last week. And, um, you know, we think that breakout gives us an initial upside target count to 130. The longer term, we think this stock could carry to 180. And that's about 70% upside from uh, last night's closing price. Uh, for traders, we would use a stop loss at about $90 to manage uh, our, our risk budget. That sets up a four to one positive risk view to our longer term target. And what about on the short side? 
Again, I said meta before, and I'm going to stick with meta as uh, the place you'd want to fade it. Um, you know, if you own it, you'd, you, I would sell it going into uh, the report. Uh, and if uh, you're a hedge fund and you can go short, uh, I think this is an opportune uh, way to uh, uh, potentially double your money. Um, stock went out at around 130. Um, it broke down from 165, a key level that counts to about $100 on the downside. Uh, we get a, a bigger measured move target off the larger degree pattern, though, to about $60, which uh, marks you know, a range of about 30 to 110% uh, uh, profit potential from a short sale here, uh, depending whether we make that, uh, that stretch target or not. Uh, to the stretch target, we would set a 150 stop loss. That sets up a better than three to one positive risk skew here. And, uh, you know, I would just point out that the relative strength of Meta uh, to the S&P is just perilous at this point. It's the worst that we've seen of any of the major uh, mega cap uh, tech communications plays. Um, I think that there's a real problem at Meta, and you've already seen, you know, key managerial changes, uh, you know, with um, uh, Sheryl Sandberg leaving, and, uh, you know, I think also uh, some key uh, people on the board uh, bailing out. I, you don't see that happen if, uh, you know, the long-term uh, outlook for the company is is rosy. I just don't see that happening. Jeff, certainly a week to uh, stay tuned on everything. So uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights with us. Always a pleasure. And everyone watching, thank you for watching and good luck investing.